Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> we're back at it here again. I think plant based. Yeah, we have very special. We have special guests. guests. We have the Indian Rock Vegans. Yeah, hi guys. Dan and Sean, how's it going? <laughs> hi. Hi, Julia. Great. Jean. Great. Great. Gorgeous morning, and uh, we're happy to be here. Yeah. Great. Where are you guys located? Well, that's the, I guess, to start from the beginning is Indian Rock is a small hamlet, and that's hence why our social media platforms are Indian Rock Vegans. Indian Rock is at the north end of Naramata, uh, located in the Okanagan Valley here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. And so it's just outside of Penticton, so oh, on nice. the Okanagan Lake. That's yeah. Great. yeah. That's great. So how about so, uh, yeah. you guys start by telling the listeners a little bit more about yourself and how you guys uh, became vegan? Sure, absolutely. Well, I guess, you know, this, it's, <laughs> big a big, it's a big answer. Yeah, yeah, right? the, uh, it really, it started with me um, in the fall of 2010. Actually, it started with our teenage son. In the fall of 2010, uh, our son had come home. He was in grade 10 at the time, and he'd come home and had joined a gym. And at the gym, he wanted to do weightlifting and bodybuilding and they told him you will need to take those protein powders if you ever want to put muscle on so like a good mom off to the health food store i went and i'm looking at these giant jugs of you know those great big barrels of <laughs> whey powder and I'm, I'm looking at them with the paragraphs of ingredients and the sales clerk comes over and she says to me oh who are you buying that how old is your son 15 she kind of leans in and she kind of whispers you want to do some research on that before you give it to your kids and I thought wow how often do you have a sales clerk kind of discouraging you from buying one of their products right. so it was intriguing I went home and I googled whey protein powder and by my good fortune and luck I came across a YouTube video by Dr. John McDougall called the perils of dairy and it went on to talk about all of the detrimental effects of eating dairy products. And it blew my mind because I was in my mid-40s. I had been told my entire life that you need uh, dairy for, you know, strong bones and teeth and to grow healthy and all of this kind, all of the things that we've heard <laughs> um, for, for decades. Yes. And it just blew my mind. And initially I thought, who is this crazy quack, right? <laughs> and But it was just... So incredible what he was saying that I watched it a few more times, like back to back. I think I watched it like three times and it was just kind of stunning. And of course, YouTube, you know, it always has the other associated videos. So it was all of the other doctors in the plant-based movement, T. Colin Campbell, Neil Barnard, Dean Ornish, all of these people. So I started watching these and it just blew my mind because there's this parallel universe out there. And so... Um, Something just triggered my curiosity, my imagination, everything, and I took the deep dive. <laughs> and that Christmas, actually, Dan gave me a Kindle, so I started downloading all of their books and reading, like just obsessively Gracious. reading about this. The I, fiction books. Yeah, I haven't read show. fiction since 2010. Let's put it that way. Um, mm. So I started to lean into that, cooking, you know, kind of that way for my family. And then I started eating that way myself altogether. So I was making, making two meals, one for myself, one for my family. We had two teenagers at home and Dan at the time. And... Um, then I read The China Study by Dr. T. Colin Campbell, and that was the quintessential moment for me that I thought to myself, there is no way I can continue feeding my family in the manner that I had been. So it was April 1st, 2011, April Fool's Day, that <laughs> I cleaned out the entire kitchen, all processed foods, all animal products. I, you know, any meat in the freezer I took out to the forest for the coyotes. I showed up at my neighbor's door with frozen, you know, I pounds know. of butter and bacon. And I said, hey, you guys want this? And they looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, <laughs> okay, but why are you giving this away? And so 
Uh, I said to the family, this is how we're eating. Too bad, so sad if you don't like it, but this is, I do the grocery shopping, I do the cooking, this is how we're eating. We were confident, though, in a sense, she's a from scratch cook to begin with, but still a little reluctant. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, too, I had thought that we were eating a really healthy diet because I was making everything from scratch, and I know now that that Mm. was certainly not the truth. So I think uh, what's important to point out, at this time, I weighed 300 pounds. And oh, wow. while I made the switch for health, uh, this amazing side effect was weight loss. And uh, the first month, I lost 15 pounds without even trying. And that was no exercise because I was 300 pounds and I'd been obese and out of shape for so many years that exercise was not even a, an equation in my life at all. Um, and it, it was miraculous, like 15 pounds from eating mountains of food plants. But um, it was like, holy crow. And so that was something that I really wasn't expecting because I had tried everything. I had done the Weight Watchers, the Jenny Craig, the, you know, you name it, Nutrisystem, you name it. And when you are on that diet, sure, you lose weight. But the minute you go back to the standard American diet, the the way most people eat, it all comes Mm -hmm. back. Right. So, um, so. You know, the family initially was not super thrilled, particularly the kids. <laughs> yeah, and, and it wasn't uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> culinary delights of meals. And there were some ac- epic fails at first, for sure. But, um, <laughs> you know, it got better and better. And then I kind of said, okay, you can have anything you want on Sundays. So they would eat Your what they'd want on, day. you know, they'd have whatever they want on Sunday. And then they'd realize that they did not actually feel that well on Monday morning. No. And so it was a gradual thing for them. And mm. and I do know that, and I always say this joke, is that, you know, they'd pick at their dinners and then they like, oh, mom, we're going for a drive, which was code for drive-through. <laughs> oh. <And> so, <laughs> oh, those sneaky ones. So, they go so through the drive-through. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was definitely a transition for them. No, for right. me, I just started I was losing probably initially and of course the more that you need to lose the faster it comes off mm-hmm. initially and I was losing you know four pounds a week without you know being hungry yeah. just you know and so then probably after I'd lost about 60 pounds I started adding in walking and really walking is all I've ever done yeah. until this past uh, fall we joined a gym but um, and so I went on to lose 133 pounds in that wow. those two wow. years. in about two years. Well, you look great. I can't well, even imagine thanks. you like having well, that much. Well, full disclosure. Weight. Unfortunately, the Corona 15 has hit us as well. So, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah. and but so, you know, losing that much weight after being obese for most of my adulthood, um, particularly. I think like most women, I had one child, I gained a ton of weight during that pregnancy, second pregnancy gained even more, and uh, I think that's a common um, story for many women. And so to go on and change your life and and lose that much weight uh, really changes your your relationship with the world. Um, It was interesting to meet people that I hadn't seen for a long time. I was really interested. It was it was really emotional, actually. I would meet some women that I had known, and they would be so stunned by my weight loss because they had struggled with weight all their life that they would start to cry <sighs> in, wow. in public places. And it was just so heart-wrenching because I know what it's like to be overweight and feel helpless and to think that you're an embarrassment to your children and that you sit on the sidelines and, that was and the not participate. Thing. Yeah, I think that really affected our, our family life as well because we're not, you know, fitness fanatics, but uh, downhill skiing and, and water sports and so on. And camping. Camping. And so play a lot. soccer yeah. on the lawn, things you know. like that. I just... I was a spectator in our family's life. Yeah, right. And so it was a huge evolution for me personally. Yeah. And, um, and you know, here I am. That started, well, 2000, you know, leaned in 2010, really did it 2011. And here we are, 2000, you know, uh, 2020. And 
you know, statistically, they say that 98% of people gain back all their weight plus more. Mm. And I have not. It has been the case. And, um, and I think that, that well, thank you. Yeah. And I really think that that's a testimony to the plant based lifestyle. It's that, and it's a lifestyle, it's not a diet. Exactly. And that's, it's so yeah. important to, to see that and know that if you eat this way for the rest of your life, and, and don't eat too much vegan food, but more plant-based food, because that's what we did this summer during COVID. What do you mean um, by that? More of, no, well, you know, whole vegan. food. Because we're whole, food. Yeah, at home yeah. we're whole food plant-based. But there are all um, these vegan places out there, you know, that are opening oh up. Yeah. They're like, exactly. yeah, <laughs> oh, it's so it. hard. All these it. It's burgers. Wonderful. <laughs> and it, yeah, and it's oh my goodness. So we were in Vancouver for a week this summer, and it was like we found vegan croissants. And you right, know, like we yeah. saw oh, your post, yeah, yeah. from Level yeah. V, right? All these amazing <laughs> yeah. foods, which are wonderful for the animals and wonderful for the planet. But you know, they're lovely as treats, but they have right. to be viewed as treats because exactly. uh, you're not going to get to your optimal health on those. Mm -hmm. What will give you optimal health is fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, um, legumes. Those are those are. So your, again, your differenti daily. differentiating the terminology whole food plant based versus vegan. I think a lot more people are understanding it now that vegan refers to the ethical side of this lifestyle as to eliminating the exploitation and use of animals in your food, in your fashion, in your household wear, in your personal hygiene, and in all your life as much as possible to, to for, for the least harm possible. Uh, now, it's um, one of the more humorous accounts, too, with her weight loss, again, just in the initial stages when we would, uh, again, as a couple, meet up with people, and uh, <laughs> or if it was individuals who, you know, well, who knew us both, but um, we hadn't seen it in a while again, and uh, the, the the typical encounter would go at know, a wedding. At we're a at a wedding. wedding. We're at a wedding one time. Yeah, we're at a wedding. The one that was that was pretty wild, and uh, <laughs> there was some awkwardness as to my my friends and acquaintances coming up to me say, "Oh, I haven't seen you in a long time." It was a workmate. That it was, was a workmate, and yeah. uh, so some of the other peer group were there too that you know don't see it often, and uh, they were standing more shoulder to shoulder to me, and the conversation was mostly directed between myself and the individual with the odd glance towards Sean with the typical head to toe. Of course, she had sunglasses on, she was dressed to the nines, looking like she did and does. And, um, and then until she spoke, and took my sunglasses off. And took off. her sunglasses off, and then their jaws would drop. <laughs> and it was oh, a wow. sense of relief because I think they thought Dan had showed up with a date. Yeah. And like, where's Sean? Where's Sean? <laughs> he's having an affair and he's bringing her to our wedding? Yeah. What is this? <laughs> What's going on here? What have we missed? And that happened quite often. And we have this lovely uh, Italian couple. Uh, he's since passed, but his wife is still here and close by to us and very dear to her heart we would always go visiting and I always remember the one time Al was in his living room and they had this big picture window across the sidewalk and uh, we walked up saw him watching his soccer and rang the doorbell and we could hear Maria in the background who's at the door Al and I hear him clearly say Oh, well, it's Dan, but I don't know who the heck is with them. <laughs> <laughs> so Maria, this older Italian woman, beautiful, fabulous, friendly woman. Again, the conversation starts. She's looking at me. She kind of this kind of look of disdain almost and not acceptance as to who is this. And then when Sean started talking, she just grabbed yeah. her face and then went into an yeah. Italian bella oh my oh yeah yeah they do that moments. yeah we yeah. have so italian was... background so we know how italians yeah. react yeah. they actually tell you straight ahead wow you lost weight and stuff like Very that right yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. And, now, and oh my gosh and that's wonderful yeah. for you and then again with myself too during those two years when she started into this i'm typical male late 40s uh, shift worker with with RCMP. I've been with the RCMP just retired about 33 years now. But you know, always mostly a shift worker, four on, four off, 12 hour shifts, yeah. uh, which can be a bit difficult to contend with proper nutrition and diet. And typically, you know, I was about 35 pounds overweight. Uh, you go to the physician and you hear the typical things of metabolic syndrome, uh, pre diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, high uh, cholesterol levels, and the weight. And during those two years of even just eating 95% that way in the home, 
I lost the weight. Uh, my blood panels were uh, just improved drastically. No more prediabetes, eliminated the metabolic syndrome. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, all disappeared, yeah. and um, we thought, well, wow, this has been fantastic. We thought we were bulletproof, yeah. really, you know. So that brought us to the fall of 2013, yeah. you know. So I was uh, down to, you know, and and I I have to say too that I had never set a goal of how much weight I wanted mm -hmm. to lose. You know, I didn't even really go into this for weight loss. It was the secondary and lovely side effect of eating plants. Um, but it was like, oh, well, maybe I can lose 40 pounds. Oh, maybe I can lose 60. Maybe I can lose 80. Oh, my God, I just lost 100. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it just kind of kept going until it found its balance, until it found like I felt good and I wasn't losing anymore. Um, so, I mean, I have to say that to people. Don't even set yourself a limit because the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. Really, it's amazing what you can do. So, yeah, here we were, 2013, thinking that everything was great. Our kids were plant-based now. We were plant-based. We were plant -based. about to become empty nesters. Yeah, <laughs> Dan was about to retire in a couple of years. We were like, whoa, awesome. Life is good. Yeah. And, and then. Yeah, and then, <laughs> uh, you know, a big shoe dropped. I, I suffered uh, uh, from a week of abdominal, extreme abdominal pain, not really knowing what was it was about and i've been relatively healthy all my life other than the typical uh, work related injuries from you know wrestling with what we would refer to as clients now uh torn rotator cuffs and things like that but i'd never really experienced anything you know like what was going on and we have in my family like everybody you know there's certain medical things that seem to happen on and on and uh, this extreme abdominal pain for a whole week. And I was thinking, well, it's probably kidney stone or a kidney infection. We've got kidney stones and gastro things going on in our, my side of the family. And I thought, oh, this isn't good. So I put it off all week. I worked through it the week and workmates were looking at me saying, you don't look well at all. What's going on? And kind of put it aside. And that Saturday, November 9th, 2013, after a day of uh, splitting firewood, um, came back into the house and just buckled over in pain. I said, we've got to go to the hospital. Something's going on here. Oh. And uh, I, I can't know. put this off anymore. Right. So we drove into Penticton and um, typical thing, you know, and uh, to the emergency ward. Uh, and because of the pain I was in, they put me on a morphine drip. And um, they said, okay, well, we'll see what's happening here. The first order of the day is, of course, is some scans. Uh, they took scans and, uh, you know, emergency room you sit and sit and sit the doctor came back and uh, had you know the papers clutched in his one hand he ushered us off into one of the examination rooms and it was that from that point it became very surreal in that it was just so odd uh, as to what happened was that I didn't even have a chance to sit or you know we we're just standing there the three of us and he looked at me and said Dan it's not it's not a kidney infection or, or kidney stones uh, it's cancer. Your right kidney is one massive tumor. Oh, wow. Um, wow. And he went into this, like, a couple of sentences into even speaking, and that's you. You're just kind of like... Oh, it just, it just uh, you know, pulls the rug from under your feet, and that typical of, you know, you're thinking to yourself, and the, what's being said is resonating to you, and you hear those words cancer, and, he's, you know, they explain that the preliminary indications were that it was the right kidney was one massive tumor, that it had metastasized out of the kidney into the vein of cava and had spread into my lymph nodes. So oh, wow. not knowing a lot about cancer, but you know when as soon as you hear the word spread, you know that it's refers to the term as it's metastasized. Right. And um, so we off we went home with, you know, the next couple of weeks of notifying my coworkers that I was going to take a leave of absence. Uh, and uh, we were told that it was, you know, stage four kidney renal cell carcinoma is terminal. Uh, and then the specialist, we met with the specialist. And again, he explained as to what had happened was that that tumor growing into the vein of cava, growing towards my lung and hearts, and that there was lymph nodes in the immediate area that were affected, as well as distance lymph nodes. And uh, they stated that um, there, there's no effective treatment for it, uh, that um, chemo and radiation is not effective. Uh, wow. that um, I had months to two years to live uh, and that I would get sicker and that it would be a very unpleasant and miserable two years. And that's, they said, we'll set you up with the oncologist and, and then we go from here. The first order of the day, though, is we do know 
you're you're very you're extremely healthy and it's interesting because aside from the cancer <laughs> i was extremely healthy and i looked then like i do now and in fact a little slimmer and, and leaner <laughs> thanks and, covid yeah, yeah we you know we looked really great so it was very again very difficult to to understand and comprehend but again they explained that that tumor probably had grown for about 15 20 years to reach where it was and um, they said, well, you're extremely healthy, even though you're age, you're, you're, you're a great candidate for the surgery. So we've got to set up the surgery. So they set up the surgery date that Christmas Eve. Uh, that's how the four of us spent our Christmas in Vancouver at the Vancouver General Hospital, where I went uh, under for the surgery, an extreme surgery with uh, two urologists and a cardiologist on hand. As they were, they said that they, you know, they were going to be splitting me wide open, pulling all organs aside to have a good look around, Whoa. and uh, that they would either have to dissect the vena cava, which is that main truncheal vein that all your organs are attached to, clamping everything off, or and then removing possibly some lymph nodes and removing the full kidney. Um, and that uh, they said that you know that's it, there's a chance you might not even survive the, the surgery. That you would bleed out on the table. Yeah. Oh my God. So. It, uh, it, so I spent about six days in, at Vancouver General Hospital. I don't remember. I remember very very little uh, about my hospital stay. I had an intravenous in my neck and my arm, an epidural on my back, a uh, catheter installed as well. Wow. And the only, the biggest, the, the one most vivid memory I have was, you know, it's an older hospital, hospital room. You got that large TV screen that looms above your bed. And I remember one afternoon I kind of woke up and there was this, the TV was off and I could see my reflection in this black darkened screen of all these tubes out of my neck and my arm and looking the way I did. All and machines I, around all you. All the machines around me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I never in my life what I thought that I would be where I was and yeah. yet there I was yeah so the we, whole thing the is whole like a dream as you, you just march through this dream of yeah. you know I think all of us think oh that happens to somebody else right, right. and and you just kind of you're just marching through this weird surreal dream yeah. thinking is this really happening yeah and then, but again too with the good fortune of uh, you know adopting this lifestyle and becoming so much healthier um it, you, you, you have this hope. Yeah. And, you know, as soon as he was diagnosed, uh, well, I mean, we spent two weeks in shock. And then it was kind of, I kind of really switched mm -hmm. my research and reading to nutrition and cancer. And what's really interesting is there's a hundred years of data showing that animal protein um, grows cancer cells. And it kind of, it really pissed us off because yeah. it's like, first, why aren't we hearing about this? And then it was also kind of, um, okay, well then, been reading about this, let's put it to the test. Yeah. So we started, uh, before his surgery, what I called is our nutritional program of excellence. Yeah. And we took the deep dive of, uh, we, you know, had been eating a lot of things, but we, we, we were totally oil free no processed foods, not even broken grains, mm -hmm. so no flour wow. products even. We were just eating whole grains and yeah. mountains of greens and several times a day, um, just feeding him with as much nutrients as possible to get him ready for yeah. this surgery. So and it was, you know, backtracking to November 9th that evening, that was the very moment when he stated that I'd been diagnosed with cancer that I went 100% whole food plant based and was in my mind that I was uh, from that point forward eliminating all animal products yeah. uh, based on what we had been learning and what Sean had been teaching me and um, there was no question about it and the reason I often ask well why did you do that and the simple reason is is I wanted to live I didn't want to die and I wanted to stack the odds in my favor as much as possible and based on what we had learned together it was evident that if you're the one thing that you're doing three times a day that has obviously a great effect on your health is nutrition 100 plant 100 percent plant-based from that right. time forward right yeah. and you know lots of people ask us and reach out to us about you know cancer patients and all of that kind of thing and we certainly don't advise people to do or not do chemo or whatever I mean that's a decision that you have to make with your your family and your medical team but what we do encourage people to do we is tip those the scale in your favor 
eat a whole food plant-based diet. I mean, it will prepare you for surgery. It will make you healthier for yeah. what come what may, even yeah. chemo if you're doing that. Um, there's so much research showing that you're better off on a plant-based diet, that it's more effective, that you have less side effects, all of those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Dan, and then so then did you feel like your recovery was better too because you were plant-based? Well, yeah, definitely. That that was I was gonna thank you for asking that because you know post surgery again, um, well, you know I was stapled shut with about fifty three staples across my abdomen, wow. and um, I couldn't eat. So um, you know initially, uh, and because of all the drugs I was on for the first you know a couple of days, I don't do well with meds like many of us, and it didn't take long before you know up at the middle of the night wrenching your gut out vomiting with nothing there and these staples across your abdomen I said that's enough of all the drugs extra strength Tylenol to try and get me through a bit of the pain and then I kind of started sleeping better which then again then permitted to me to, to try and eat a bit and essentially what I you know we found we knew what's nutrient dense and high in calories because I lost a lot of weight from the surgery right. and um, it was nuts so freshly roasted nuts on the bedside that I would just graze you know, throughout the day yeah. that I was bedridden. Yeah. And then what was interesting too is then sleep happened because I was, I, I, I was, you know, the insomnia was just brutal. I, I never suffered insomnia like that because of the drugs. And then sleep, sleep came back, which helped me recover. And then you start to notice that I'm starting to feel better. I'm starting to recover from the surgery. And um, slowly but surely that started to happen. And it was, you know, bedridden. Then I was downstairs in the living room, making it downstairs. Then the next, and within a month or so, I was, you know, walking to the end of the driveway, <laughs> which was <laughs> a big feat. And yeah. uh, within a couple of months, you know, I was actually outside and walking a bit and not doing the five full kilo five kilometers that we do together, but I was starting up again. So, and that's where it really clicks on it to you um, that, um, hang on a second here, I'm not getting sicker. And I'm starting to feel better. Um, my recovery was was starting to be as self-evident as it was pretty remarkable yeah. from the surgery. We went to the doctors. They looked at the incision site, and they just kind of shrugged and shook their heads and said, "My gosh, that incision site looks just great." Like, yeah, I mean, <sighs> almost invisible. Yeah, really. So they were they were very happy with that. And then in the interim, I have a part of my medical team, of course, was with the cancers. Uh, agency here in in, uh, in Kelowna with an oncologist and and she stated well um, there's nothing we can do for you medically but you know if you want to consider going on to a trial study uh, uh, that uh, with some of the newer drugs that they're testing they're not meant or or or, or expected to help you but it may uh, it, it, it may do something for you it may extend your life and that's essentially what you're dealing with because we were told that we would be naive to think that the cancer we wouldn't th grow or, or, or spread. And mm -hmm. they said it's going to spread and grow. We, 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 this is terminal. This is terminal. And um, so. And there's only a 95% or no, a, a 5% chance of survival to five years. So a 95% chance of dying with stage to four five years. Cancer. Yeah. And wow. um, they, but they, again, they remarked, they said, you know, aside from the cancer, you do it. You're, you're you're so healthy. Your blood pressure is always good. Every time you come in for your for your checkups, your weight, everything, your blood markers are bang on. So because of that, and the cancer people, you know, people diagnosed here this often is watch and wait. We can watch and wait, and you know, see what the cancer is doing because you're so healthy. And so uh, that permitted me till March to 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 recuperate fully from the surgery when they stated that well, there's a immunotherapy phase one trial study that's taking place out of Vancouver that you're an excellent candidate for because you haven't received other treatment and just because of how your health is, you're a good candidate and we think we can get you onto it. So that was with immunotherapy drugs and the purpose of those drugs is that they they hope that they can the drugs can bump up your immune system to get past the blocks and walls that the cancer cells put up. Um, and then, uh, so we, we thought, okay, well, we'll give that a shot. And uh, you get the thick package uh, delivered to you and go through the instructions and all the horrific side effects that are, you know, the risks that are involved. And then there was one paragraph in it that was interesting. It was said that, you know, please note that this, this uh, trial study and these drugs um, are not to be expected to be, to be a personal benefit to you or to improve your health. So you're 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 a guinea pig. You're you're a test subject. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so with that, so he was accepted onto the trial study. So we had to go down to Vancouver for everything mm -hmm. because it's uh, very, you know, stringent. very stringent. So it, every, all the MRIs, everything had to be done on the same machines. And so there was a, a really, really solid baseline. Um, so in meeting with the oncologist there and all the trial study staff, I said to them, well, this is basically an experiment, so we want it noted we're whole food plant based because if you know if that's you really need to know the big picture. Right. Doesn't matter. We don't care. Doesn't make a difference. What? Kind of eat roll your eyes. Want. Eat what you want. That we don't care about. No, wow. no. And so, and you know, funny enough, we have a, a friend who's a physician who was able to call Dan's file from them and look through it, and there is not one mention of us being plant. Oh, wow. They don't want to muddy the waters. If it's if he survives, they want it because of their drugs, mm. not because of what he ate. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then like looking at the times the, again, the you know the how things had had gone through. So diagnosed in November, and we were told it was going to spread and grow. Uh, CT scans almost every six weeks. Uh, so that brings us to late March, where I start up into the treatment. From even from then till March, there was no spread, no growth of, of the tumor or in other organs. So that was encouraging to see. And uh, so the treatment itself was, uh, the protocol was four, uh, three treatments, four, uh, four, four? four treatments of the combination of the drugs every three weeks. And uh, following that would be a maintenance treatment of the one drug every two weeks for the rest of my life or forever how long my body could endure it, is how they phrased it. Wow. And that meant, so we were off to Vancouver every three weeks, uh, and then possibly for the rest of my life, down to the clinic down there again every two weeks. So, you know, it's a five hour drive. You, uh, The thing is, is that, um, you know, it always pulls you back too, to, you know, the initial stages, regardless, even if you're getting healthier and healthier, you're you're there. You're participating in these 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 treatments you're in that and atmosphere. that atmosphere of, of it all. But um, so we started up, and um, interestingly enough, again, we walked through the doors of the cancer clinic, looking the way we do. Um, and because I think I had this mindset from early on too, as well, is that that although it was hard to 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 come to grasp with that stage four terminal cancer. I always had the ideology of, I feel the way I do at this very moment. How do I feel right now? And that would go from the time that I would open my eyes in the morning throughout the day, and then till the point where I jump back into bed at the end of the day, think about the day, close my eyes and say, okay, that was that was today, tomorrow's another day, and wake up. And then, But fortunate for me, every day I'd wake up again and say, okay, here we go, I feel good today. Now, there's some rougher days, of course, but again, um, you get into this thing as to I, I don't want to wallow in it too much because I don't know how much time I have. So the time that I do have, I want to ensure that I'm enjoying it as much as possible and doing what I can with that time. So that was always kind of the mindset. I was never angry about it. You think about as to why me and all that, but there's no, there's, there's no sense in getting angry about it or, or so on. You just have to realize that whatever time you may have, you got to use it well and and so so yeah we'd be at the cancer clinic and um yeah. <laughs> you know we'd make our little visits to vancouver as fun as possible and because dan's cancer is relatively rare we were always put in on on breast cancer day mm -hmm. and so we'd be in a, a room with all of these women who lost all their hair were just so frail and gray and you know so gaunt and it was really difficult because, again, we would walk in looking great and people would be Kinda like, which of those two, what, what, who, why, you know, so we'd go into these room with these women and we'd have fun and we would be laughing and talking and pretty soon the whole room would be kind of laughing and nurses would be looking in going, what the hell's going on in there? <laughs> you know, because it was like. We're gonna have as much freaking fun as we possibly we, we can. We cried a lot. We cried a lot, but, but boy, man, we, we laughed, laughed a lot, lot yeah. too. Mm. And um, so it was, <laughs> it was a crazy ride. Yeah, it and was a crazy so we ride. we kind of uh, you know every three weeks off, and uh, it was a couple of days after the third treatment. Came back home, woke up in the middle of the night with fever and or feeling feverish, 
and that is one of the red flags for cancer people. So I tried to wake her up and I said, we got to go to the hospital. She said, no, 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 go back to sleep. Everything's okay. I said, no, no, we got to go. And uh, we went to the hospital. They, uh, they drew blood. They had some difficulty getting the tests back to Vancouver because the system was down. We ended up... Yeah, they said, go home. Go home. It's okay. We, we're home. not quite sure what we need to do because of this protocol. You're on a trial study. We have to get a hold of, of the cancer clinic. And went home. That's about 4 o'clock in the morning. Turned all our phones Turned off. Turned all the phones off. By noon, we woke up to all the phones flashing and, and messages. And so we hit the machine. And it was, of course, one of the, the physicians at the cancer clinic in, in a Vancouver. panic. Yeah. Saying, where are you guys? Get back to the hospital your liver enzymes are at near fatal levels right now. The drugs have done what some of the side effects was, of course, uh, it, they've attacked your, your yeah. liver. And they, they, you know, that was explained to us because it bumps up your immune system so much. It's like opening that cage right. of a yeah. wild tiger right. and not knowing what that tiger might do. So the drugs yeah. had attacked my liver. I was immediately dismissed from the trial study at well, that time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we had to go back to the hospital right yep. away and you had to be put on intravenous um, uh, prednisone. prednisone to try and you know stop the attack and save the liver. Yeah, uh, and then they they said, yeah, your liver enzymes are 25 times higher than the normal levels. They normally dismiss anybody when they reach five times the normal level. So it was a dire situation. And then, as anybody can tell, with prednisone being a steroid, oh. it's pretty brutal. It uh, you know I was I didn't get weight gain from that steroid, but what I got was you know uh, you know high energy. And I was like a, a you know a, a tween with uh, diagnosed with ADHD, and if the cancer wasn't going to kill me, she I was gonna because yeah. I was I like I woke up talking oh, and I wow. fell asleep talking and angry and yeah. just I mean Most, all of the worst things that prednisone can bring. Yeah, but that was six months onto the prednisone, and again slowly but surely I recovered from that. And then all the meanwhile, is again the CT scans are no not showing spread or growth. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, you know, midsummer. We go into the fall. Uh, so, yeah, off the trial study, dismissed yeah. because, you know, yeah, it doesn't look good to kill your trial patient studies when right. when uh, when you're trying to get that drug to, yeah. to market. Right. So they said, wow. you know, you know, they've always accounted that that people that have extreme side effects are the ones that seem to have had a response from the drug. But what always stuck in our mind was that, you know, I was supposed to be on those drugs for the rest of my life. Yet here I was now dismissed, and so I'm after three doses. After three doses, and here I am. So I'm on that high wire, essentially, with a without a safety line. And um, we went into the fall. They started using the term remission. Once again, they just shrugged their shoulders as to we, you know, the, you're you're Superman. You this is a remarkable case of remission. Um, and then again, no spread, no growth, and that we started getting shrinkage in those remaining lymph nodes. And uh, by Christmas, I had the, one of the last CT scans. Uh, we got the results back from them. And by fe January, February, when I got the results, they said, your cancer is radiologically undetectable. And if you were to walk into this clinic as a new patient worrying about cancer, we would turn you around because you're essentially, you're, you're cancer free. Wow. So, so that wow. was that was that. That's yeah. pretty remarkable. And they didn't even ask what what I what are you doing? You know, like not even no, asking very, about your diet or anything, right? Yeah, that's so. No, remarkable. They, they always keep doing what you know. A lot of people probably hear this. Well, whatever you're doing, keep doing. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> I think you know, you, uh, as an adjunct treatment, the one most important thing that you can do, and we always hear, you know, uh, proper rest nutrition 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 whole food plant-based nutrition right get rid of all those animal products out of your, yeah. your your diet and it's shocking when you are at the cancer clinic you know they have all of these people the volunteers who you know do a lovely job and they come around with a little trolley giving people little treats and things like that to make it a nicer atmosphere but mm. the crap that's on those carts is uh, the reason that everybody's having <laughs> Is there in the first place? Yeah, yeah. I, I hate hard. hospital food. It's, it's the worst. Just I don't even know how it's going to help people yeah, get right. better. It's ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had so, dear ones dying from cancer in my family, so I'm, I'm so amazed with this story. You know, it's great. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it really touches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I lost a lot of muscle mass from the surgery, not necessarily the cancer. So uh, you know, it was always building back up and and then getting back onto the walks and hikes and and so on and. Um, so it was always just a steady build and then you say to yourself too, well, 
you know, every day is a great day. You know, you know, after going through something like that, um, you know, life is pretty good. And, yeah. and uh, we're fortunate where we live here in British Columbia and in particular here in the Okanagan and again here at Indian Rock. We're so blessed with the environment and the geography that we have, which I, I do believe really, really had a big part in my recovery and being aware and mindful of every moment of the day, every yeah. every season. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, seven years in November. Yeah. And wow. not only has Dick been yeah, surviving, he's thriving. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. amazing. But you have wow. such a great yeah. mindset, I find, you know, like... I don't know. I think it's really scary to find out you have cancer, you know, but you really did the best out of it yeah. each day. And that's very crucial to your diet, but also how you handle the situation because mm -hmm. you don't yeah. want to stress your body too much. Right. It's already in stress. And right. If you get scared worse. and you don't know if you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, it gets worse. Yeah, it like gets your immune worse. system yeah. suffers a lot. From yeah, it. exactly. Yeah, and, and well, I it think was... we're very grateful that we came upon all of this information well before. We have people that reach out to us that have just been diagnosed, and I think, oh my gosh, to have that stress, that fear, and think about having to completely revise your kitchen and reteach yourself how to cook and grocery shop, it's a lot. So, so we were lucky we were we into were, that lifestyle yeah, even before absolutely. the diagnosis. And, yeah. it's, and so I think that's, you know, I hope as people realize the health benefits and how detrimental animal pro products and processed food is, that people will transition to this before in preparation, right? Yeah. You don't want to wait till that right. 11th hour. You want to set yourself up for success before that yeah, because you know right. I, you know and and some people reached out to us and said oh well i guess your plant-based diet didn't work that well because dan has cancer but mm -hmm. they said it would have been developing for 15 to 20 years beforehand yeah. well we were eating tons yeah, of meat and right. cheese and dairy. yeah so that was that was the thing and you know i have to say as well during his recovery um uh after the surgery, of course, uh, the pathologist takes samples and they grow them in, in a, a petri dish to see what the doubling time of the cancer cells are to get a better idea of what they're dealing with. And while Dan was still recovering, I took the call saying that we've gotten the results back from the pathologist. And it was like, we really are sorry to tell you, but it's an extremely aggressive form of cancer. And I remember hanging up the phone and thinking, that's it. We're done. We're done. And... Right. Uh, what I've come to realize now, what I think we, we believe, is that that Petri dish was yeah, hospitable. a hospitable environment for those cancer cells to grow. And what we did with Dan's body is make it very cancer cells to grow. Mm. And so I, I think, you know, there's um, there's just so many apples. And so that kind of launched us into our next after yeah. we got rid of the obesity and yeah. the cancer. Yeah, we were, again, to kind of a segue into how this platform and, and becoming advocates for this lifestyle was we were so fortunate, again, through social media, connecting with the, the makers of the film Eating You Alive, which uh, um, people might be aware of it, is a, just a fantastic health food documentary on whole food plant-based nutrition. I just happened to stumble upon their trailers on Facebook and it was a Sunday afternoon, and I kept seeing them. So finally, I just said, I'm going to direct message them. And, you know, when is this movie coming out? It looks fantastic. Yeah. Samuel Jackson, James Cameron and his wife, all the rock star physicians in the movement and, and, and the, the researchers. And I was thinking, oh, they'll get back to me maybe soon. And then, sure enough, the message popped back within seconds. And we all I said was, we're, this is what we've been through. We're so excited to see your film. When's it coming out? And the producer introduced herself, said, can I call you right now? I'd like to discuss what you guys have been through. So, sure, let's. I'd love to speak with you. So, Mary Lee Jacobs uh, and I spoke there in um, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and she said, wow, you know, we've just finished production, but your story of you and Sean is so fascinating that we're thinking we might want to reopen production of the film. Would you send us clips of yourself and Sean to kind of give us an idea how, you know, how you present and so on. So we did that that day. I said, told her, get back upstairs. It's not a Sunday <laughs> chore day. Put something nice on, sit out in that chair. Um, and uh, we clipped ourselves 
sent him off. And then by that midweek, they said, yeah, we want you down here. When can you come down as soon as possible was when we, and I said, well, where's here? And well, they you said, sent the clips on a Sunday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was yeah, here. Was Thursday, here. we were on a plane to Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Wow. And it was like, wow. So we spent the weekend with uh, Paul and Mary Lee and the whole crew for meeting you alive and had a fabulous time. It was the first time that we publicly spoke let alone on camera about our experience and um, so it was extremely extremely exhausting and very emotional because okay. again we only friends and family before yeah. mm -hmm. so to rehash the whole story and everything yeah. like that was very yeah. difficult and then so to be involved in a project and a film of that caliber and what we had seen and then and then you wait you know eight months and you think oh we're gonna end up on the cutting room floor they said well I don't know we'll see so sure enough, we ended up in the film, and uh, that led to just a, a, just a, you know, oh, an avalanche of connectivity with other people in the movement down to LA for the premiere, where we met some of the cast, uh, and uh, we didn't meet Samuel Jackson, unfortunately, but <laughs> we met a lot of the physicians and so on. Had an amazing time, and Eating You Alive has been a platform for us where we've traveled with the film and the filmmakers, and we still do do that. And uh, all the while, too, then we call, you know, everybody refers to it as the trifecta of this lifestyle, and that's how eating animals affects our health, how eating animals affects animals, and how it affects the environment. So the animal rights ethics issue became really paramount to us as well. As a, as a, a veteran police officer, my life has always been about uh, accumulating facts, information, and evidence and also with respect to preventing um, violence and suffering and uh, victimization. So when I saw the brutality involved uh, in the animal agricultural system and always being there to advocate for victims and trying to prevent violence and, and, and bring those to justice who were, uh, you know, imposing this, this oppression and violence against victims, it, it it was it was second nature for me, just a different species and not humans anymore. That it uh, it yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tug, Thanks for what you guys do. You're yeah. amazing. It tugs yeah. on it's, it's become, yeah. when you it's start become to realize. a big part of our work. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and so since then, and then you start learning about the environmental impact of it. Uh, we've been associated with so many great. Uh, advocacy groups from Nation Rising in Canada here that are advocating our federal government to uh, increase uh, uh, subsidies to plant-based agriculture and eliminate subsidies to animal agriculture, making plant-based foods more available to all our communities, be it Indigenous, isolated in all our communities from, from all walks of life, right. uh, to uh, Dr. Celeste Rowe of, of, of Cowspiracy and Climate Healers. Uh, to, uh, you know, the uh, Anita Krantz and everybody from, from the SAVE movement. Um, meet we've the victims. Meet the victims we here in Canada that, where so. we, we, uh, we participated in Canada's first farm lockdown in Abbotsford, British Columbia last year, which yeah. happened to be a farm owned by one of the board of directors on the BC Pork Producers uh, Board. So that farm was supposed to be a gold, an ex standard. gold standard and what the activists saw inside that barn the 65 activists who entered the barn and sat there and saw themselves and what we the 200 supporters outside of the farm that day saw was just horrific and if that's the gold standard for that industry that is a sad reflection and i think you know um coronavirus itself uh mm -hmm. such a an important lesson to learn that's not really being I mean, at the very beginning, there was little oh, wet market in China, what have you, and then it seems to have been completely ignored since then. But what we know is that uh, it's a zoonotic transmission, as all epidemics and pandemics in the past have been, right back to the Spanish flu, and uh, and there'll be many more coming down the road yeah. if we continue to uh, exploit animals and, 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 animals. and factory farm them in the way that we have. There's... You know, I think you you have this. I mean, we ate meat and dairy well into our forties, and then you find out the truth that you don't have these to. products are killing us. They're killing animals. They're killing the planet, and um, it just—it's such a. It has 
just by changing what is on our fork has changed our life in every possible aspect. Yeah. Um, from the clothes we choose to the products in our home to what we eat to who we financially support to uh, I mean you know as a police officer of 33 and a half years Dan is now on the other side of the protest line right that's quite an interesting um, perspective yeah because I'm sure there was police there and they just they're doing their job but I mean you know it's it's just so weird to be seeing that. It is. And what we've seen is, uh, and then again, that's part of my work as well, not only as an animal rights activist, but as an advocate for animal rights activists. Because when you look at, you know, the strides, the positive strides that our police agencies have made in how they treat and how they react and uh, uh, interact with other social justice movements, um, how they treat and re- interact with the animal rights movement uh, looks back as to wh- what it was like years ago with other social justice movements, and they've got a long way to go. The lessons so haven't been learned. The lessons haven't been learned, where we see, you know, infringements of rights, we see uh, implicit biasness, and, and, and you see uh, uh, excessive use of force. Um, you know, like there's one image in Canada here that always brings to mind was when Elizabeth May, the leader of the Green Party, was walked away very gingerly from one of the pipeline protests in Vancouver last year. It certainly pales in comparison to how some of the animal rights uh, activists have been treated uh, by police and, and by the general public as well, too, but by police. So that's been a large part of my work and in my advocacy and, and lecturing as well helping activists best interact with police and not just the activists but I've also offered this service and this this you know insight to, insight to our police agencies across Canada and most of them aren't as receptive as they could be or should be as to what my experience is on the other side of that protest line. And I think, you know, most mm-hmm. animal activists are, are much like us, law-abiding citizens right. who have uh, had the veil lifted and have uh, learned what animal agriculture and factory farming and what is actually happening in our food system. Animal farming. I don't, animal even, like, farming. We don't even like to use the term factory farming. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and so good citizens who Law simply abiding. want to stand up for what's right. So these are, you know, and, and yet are being treated like they're criminals. Yeah. Right. And, so we, and also these people have never had any exposure or in, interaction with police. And this is what they're up against suddenly. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's... Um, We're hopeful that we'll make strides, that they can better understand the movement. We now across Canada, it's, you know, it's scary to see that we've got uh, efforts uh, that are set into motion by industry and political pressure to, to implement and, and impose these these laws, uh, which we're, you can term them as ag gag laws, where they want to prevent, uh, you know, activism to take part and protests to take uh, place uh, against the industry, because the industry is built on hiding behind these walls, and they know that they are fighting for the the hearts and minds of the public. And if the we know that as soon as the public or somebody really understands or sees what this industry is about, they don't want to participate in it. And the industry knows that the more the public realizes this, they're done. And yeah, we yeah. see that happening. We 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 fully support agriculture, but the right type of agriculture in Canada, we are fortunate. We have some of the largest and most fertile land masses on the planet. And what are we doing? We're using it to grow food. And, and, and used as an outdoor toilet for animals instead of growing food to grow to, to, to feed animals yeah. instead of growing food to feed humans. Right. What a waste. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible. It is. And they it's don't so even horrible. put like cameras in these farms, you know, that's right. what I find really yeah. suspicious. Yeah, like what do you have to hide? You, yeah. like, you, Ex- they're going to like, exactly. surveillance everybody on the street, right. but we can't look into these yeah. walls, you know? It's, that's yeah. right. it's a big deal. You know, it's so we, weird. We, we live in the Okanagan, so we're surrounded by orchards of right. apples and pears. And none of those farmers have giant fences and notifications <laughs> saying no cameras, no photos. And they don't call the police the minute you step on their apple orchards and there are yeah, not SWAT right? teams taking you down <laughs> no, because you wanted to look at an apple. No doubt. So, I mean, right? It's yeah. pretty telling. They know, you know, yeah. and then what what cameras do end up in there are the ones that are from undercover investigational efforts 
and um, they're they're really worried about that, and that's why again, in types of, 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 of laws, not just uh, provincial laws, but you know criminal code laws now that are trying to be changed to 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 increase fines and jail times for simply essentially a trespass offense to go sit in an outbuilding. And, right. you know, the farmers refer to them as their homes. No, no, these, they, they don't live in those no. barns. Let's yeah. not get ourselves. We saw the footage. So I too. think yeah. it's ridiculous. We, yeah, it's just, you know, and then so if we can, we can, you know, if we look at the monetary things that are happening, the economical issues that are at hand, our healthcare system, uh, the environmental impact, and if we can show all of these, you know, the, these different communities as to, look, this is going to be a benefit to everybody. And in the long term, and not just the immediate, but our future of our children are, are, and our, 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 mm -hmm. our, our just, you know, the, the, the next generation. Yeah. Right. So while we identify as whole food plant-based vegans, um, and, and we certainly do a lot to advocate the whole food plant-based uh, part of it, I co-facilitate the CHIP uh, program here in Penticton, the Complete Health Improvement Program, which is kind of a whole food plant based boot camp but I mean as healthy as we can be as individuals if we don't have a planet to live on it's really pointless so you know we also promote the vegan lifestyle because um, well a Beyond Burger might you know it's certainly better than a beef burger but is it better than broccoli no so it's it's always making those you know it kind of gets into the weeds but we try and uh, relay that message mm -hmm. um, because that Beyond Burger will save animals and it will save the planet. Yeah. Um, and so, it helped to help people transition. And it will help people sure. transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and you know, we obviously, you look at our, our social media, we certainly partake in those treats, uh, <laughs> you know, more frequently than we should have this As summer. That, that's but because I, they look better when when we take like those treats than the ones we make at home. <laughs> Well, yeah. yeah, you know, it's like eating whole food them. plant based, it doesn't doesn't really look appetizing as like a croissant <laughs> to most people. I think well, it's because that, it's a like that's a, true, and then that's yeah. they're also comfort foods, right? That yes, exactly. Familiar, and familiar, and it you're like, oh my emotion. god. Yeah. But don't fool yourself. Whole food plant based uh, yes. cuisine, uh, even to you know, you know to the degree of oil free plant based cuisine. Is it's not about deprivation. It's yeah. about taste sensation. It's for sure, it, it tastes amazing. I know. <laughs> exactly. But when you go to the Instagram world, everyone's like more triggered about emotion. So I feel yeah. like they I, I so. they want yeah. the pizza, yeah. the burgers, That's <laughs> right. yeah. stuff, all and the stuff, stuff we shouldn't be eating all the time, yeah. but we do. <laughs> it's amazing. There, there is you know, there's no fear for anybody who's who's you know eating a standard American diet who's a carnivore now it is so easy to transition over oh, yeah. and and have everything you've ever loved your whole life so yeah, right. questions yes. yes and this i'm sorry <laughs> yeah well i mean you guys pretty much answered most of the questions we yeah. had right but i guess like a lot of people still think it's so hard to become fully plant-based and be healthy on it like and it's really not no right like why it's do you think not. it's not and no and you guys, you know, I think when you're in Vancouver, it's really easy because there are all of these restaurants and, and there are so many things. But I really like to tell the story of my son, who was the one that started this whole thing and is uh, a plant-based vegan now and is totally dedicated. He moved up to Dawson Creek, which is in very north British Columbia, mm -hmm. and he small has town. very very small town he has been able to maintain this lifestyle there how did he and do he that? sometimes works he finds things at the grocery store yeah. he's he's turned into an amazing cook i mean there's every grocery store has beans and and whole grains sure. and vegetables and mm -hmm. fruit yeah exactly. and that's all you really need and he uh, works in work camp sometimes, and it's a non-negotiable thing. And I think that's the thing. The hardest thing is just making that decision you're going to do it. And then once you've made that decision and you make it non-negotiable, everything else falls in place. Mm -hmm. So sure. he'll go into these camps, and he will, if they can't provide him what he needs, he'll live on like rice and vegetables and fruit while he's in that camp yeah. mm -hmm. and people will be looking at him and <laughs> luckily he's a great big tall guy and pretty 
you know, he did all that bodybuilding and weightlifting, regardless of not having animal products. And they'll like, oh, what are you doing? You're not eating meat. And he'll look down at them and go, yep. And that's it. That's the end of the conversation. Yeah, why did not have to explain much? Yeah. Yeah. And then we don't shop in specialty grocery stores. Uh, we've learned, Sean does grocery store to, tours as well and kitchen cleanouts. But, you know, to you, it's just a simple matter of kind of rejigging and re, relearning as to what aisles you should be shopping in, what aisles you should be staying out of and uh, learning that. And in this day and age now, there is so much at our fingertips with the democratization of information being, you know, adopting and transitioning to a whole food plant-based diet lifestyle now is, is a pretty easy thing to do. There's it's so just many, the hardest thing you know, is making the decision. 21-day jumpstart programs that are for free, like uh, PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, has a great one that starts on the first of every month. I mean, there's just so much information out there that's available. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I do the grocery, uh, the grocery store tours, which Dan says take about two hours. And what I think people come out at the end of is realizing that it's actually a bean store. Because yeah. <laughs> there's beans in nice. the bulk, there's beans in the, in the ethnic food aisle, there's beans, 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 right? So, right. um it's not difficult. No. It just takes a little bit of commitment and a little bit of research. But my God, the benefits are amazing. And giving yourself that, you know, give yourself four to six weeks. You know, just just fully commit to doing it for six weeks and then see what the difference is, or how you start to feel, how food starts to taste, uh, you know, learning about what the information is available to, for you. As a couple, if the couple does the cooking together, relearning the cooking together is an interesting thing or with young children as well because right. there's nothing more important than, uh, you know, learning, you know, how to prepare your food and healthy food. Um, it's, an, it's an interesting experience. And I think once you get to that tail end of that six weeks, the, a large majority of the individuals that look at it without even looking at ethics and environmental they say, wow, this is, this is crazy. Yeah. It's so much better. And, and I think, too, you know, like a lot of people say, well, just take baby steps in or some people like cold turkey. But I, I do think that cold turkey is the way to go because, uh, you know, little, little changes bring little effects. And, yeah, you know, when sure. you make a huge change, the effects are huge as well. Yeah. And that's those, you know. Like that big changes give big, big results. Big, yeah, exactly. And True. it's like that first month that I did it and I lost 15 pounds. I was like, wow, of course I'm going to keep doing this, right? Yeah. So Yeah, but that yeah. would be our advice to people starting off is just, you know, look into it. And there's so much available and, and there's so much free information. Yeah. And that's that sure. Google whole food plant base and then look at whole food plant based oil yeah. free. And yeah. and yeah, just in the time that from, you know, 2010, this this past 10 years that we've been doing it, wow. it's just, you know, it's it's easy peasy now, I think. It so is. yeah, it really doesn't yeah. matter yeah. anymore where you live because if you have also the internet, as you mentioned, that's a great platform yeah. and support. Too. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Community support is there's one thing about the plant based vegan community. Uh, there's you know people are always depending on their lifestyles. They are they're involved in certain communities with sports or so on or hobbies. But I don't think there's anything like this. Um, this community it's just amazing because i think you know there's some so there this is intrinsical issues that we're dealing with that uh, are so important to all of us that uh, we can find a commonality as to doing something so good for ourselves and everything and everybody around us it uh, and it, it's a kind group mm -hmm. uh, for the most part you know you always a little bit of you know friction i guess with different ideologies well, but by and large right. well for example i mean our house uh, we've always opened our house up to vegans and people, you know, that we don't even know that might be traveling across Canada and will say, well, come and stay here if you need a place to stay because yeah. I don't think there's a lot of axe murderers that are vegan. <laughs> we not, hope. Not that we know of. <laughs> oh, I will actually we watch a documentary though. No, he was vegan. Oh, remember? he was vegan? He there was, was one. Mass murder? Yeah, remember <laughs> the uh, like oh, a media documentary on Netflix? I don't and they remember. even mentioned, oh yeah, and he's vegan. It was like oh. weird that they threw it in for some reason. Oh. Yeah, but it happens, but it's <laughs> yeah. more rare. But for the I think. most part, I think most of us, uh, you know, you're uh, you're morally aligned with with uh, the people that you uh, invite into this 
group and into our homes and I think exactly. that makes such a huge difference so it yes. um, it's been wonderful the people that we've meet, met and you know this couple middle-aged couple from middle of British Columbia here we've had such amazing contact from people around the world and, and become good friends with these giants in the movement and in the lifestyle that uh, we're just in awe and we draw so much inspiration and that's the interesting too is that we all play a part in inspiring others as because we lead by example and especially when you look at health recovery stories that is the one aspect of it that can be so powerful that because everybody a lot of people are suffering these days with heart disease obesity diabetes, diabetes and, cancer. and cancers and so on and so forth that um, it really hits home with people to see these these health reversals that are, are pretty incredible. And and while we might be an anomaly or people like think that we are in say our town, we went uh, a couple of years ago on the uh, holistic holiday at sea, which is a, a plant based cruise, and there was twenty five hundred plant based people on this boat, hmm. and everybody had an amazing recovery story yeah. <laughs> and you, we were dime a dozen on there yeah. we were we were right. nobody special because everybody was like oh i reversed this i reversed that i cured myself of this and it was like good lord and everybody's got the before and after pictures yeah. in which when we go back sean was like i've been with media relations with the rcmp as a police spokesperson for the past 10 years provincial and national level and we had adopted uh, social media as as a tool years ago so I was always of the mind of telling Sean and explaining to Sean, I said, hang on to your pants here with our association with this film. And if we want to be advocates and, and get out on a platform, you know, not that we're going to be or want to be or aspire to be huge or massive, but be aware that this is probably some of the things that we will encounter. And one of the most powerful things you can do and share is again the, those photos of the before and after which was very difficult was for her very difficult for me i was ashamed and embarrassed by those photos um and it was it was so difficult to publish them the first time mm. but i'm so glad i did because they you know they, they serve they, such as a powerful tool for serve, others yeah right. they serve it it's, such it's, hope. i feel like our stories are a gift that we can share with others to hope help them improve their lives yeah. and I think that's why we carry on doing all of this and, and the animals and you know every once in a while when you think oh why are we doing this this is so time consuming we should be out weeding the garden or something like that <laughs> you you get a message I, we got a message last week asked, thanking us for all that we share and this person expressed that they were afraid it was this was more about animal ethics that they were afraid to share with their friends what they were feeling and that she had shared a video that we'd put up and she says I don't know why I was afraid and I shared it I'm so glad I shared it and she said my voice is quiet but it's growing and I just uh, it brought me to tears uh, <laughs> and yeah yeah. You know, yeah. and the, the dedication that, uh, you know, with the animal rights movement, uh, that the dedication that so many people that uh, that this is their life and they will never stop with. And we've said the same thing is with the, every last breath that I have myself as, you know, I don't know what's what 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 will end up with me. The shoe might drop again. The cancer might come back. But I will never stop speaking for this with the animals so that people hear them more and know the truth. Because nothing's changed for me as a police investigator now retired. Uh, it's not that I, I want to spread propaganda or lies or anything like that. And on the contrary, um, I've always been a trusted source of, of truth and evidence. And I continue to do that. And we will continue to do that together with everybody. And, you know, we, we always feel guilty sometimes, too, as to not doing more or enough when we look at some of the, the, the incredible work in yourselves as well, too, the formats you guys are doing with Thanks. with podcasts yeah, and that, you. everybody can do something. You can either cook food, you can either produce videos, you can interview people, uh, you can be out there in the marches and at the protests and at the vigils. Um, you know, the most powerful one that I we always recommend for people is if you have the opportunity to look one of those animals in the eye uh, on one of those trucks and fully understand and see an animal feel fear. An animal that you you know is 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 terrified and and confused and and they they are so much like us. Mm -hmm. Right, they are. Yeah. yeah. 
I yeah. hope yeah more people are gonna wake up. It's just for some people really scary to even see this what we saw, you know, with mm -hmm. say with the pigs because they they have such human eyes, you know, there's so oh. much oh. emotions yeah. like I was like so touched by it when I first saw it at an animal farm sanctuary. I was like, there's mm -hmm. no freaking way I would ever go back eating. Yeah, like, you really feel just, that, no. that connection. Where yeah. like you, yeah. see, you see someone in there. There's something in there. and It's, it's a soul, right? Yeah, it's more it's, than a it's soul. It's very it's, sentient. It's really yeah. there. It wants to live. It's trying to survive just like, you know, us. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're yeah. all the same. Yeah. And when you visit a sanctuary, again, that's a, that's a great suggestion for people as to, you know, making the connection, making the connection mm -hmm. and see what a animal looks like yeah it's just uh, incredible right. when you've seen right. what they look like in farm situations yeah, i've been volunteering at sanctuaries for the last few years and um the pigs that eat are just so vastly different than the ones that you see on the slaughterhouse trucks they're the expression the look in their eyes everything it's and all of us would be looking that terrified if we were herded into a truck on our way to our deaths so it's um yeah. yeah it's it's been um yeah it's been a crazy 10 years so <laughs> it's bet. not that not one that we ever anticipated that uh you know like you say a veteran police officer would be out there protesting and, and that we would be advocating for for you know plant-based nutrition or, or advocating for nutrition at all just instead of just leave, you know living our lives whichever that was now wanting to share this and being so passionate about it yeah. and knowing what it can do to help others and it just yeah it just it's every part of your we we bought a farrowing crate this spring oh, wow. <laughs> for, de for demonstration purposes to take to to events and it's a farrowing crate is the the crate where you see often pictured where they will put the the mother the sow sows. who has given birth to the pigs right. where she's very restricted yet she can lie down right. a little bit oh, yeah no. so we happen to see one it was uh, on craigslist and so we Whoa. Whipped out and bought this thing. Didn't talk too much. Get into details what we <laughs> yeah. were doing with it. Or, <laughs> the guy's like, oh, we... are you getting pigs? And we're like, not yet. <laughs> and <laughs> off we went. <laughs> had, he known, had he known what we were going to be doing with it, using it as a demonstration I tool. I don't from, know yeah. that he would have sold it to us. But anyway, it's on our property. And nobody comes on our property without getting a tour of this crate right. contractors visitors neighbors everybody and i'm i'm even shocked when you know when you let a vegan even see it and touch has it not seen and one. and you know who hasn't seen one in person it is such an effective tool because you can you not even imagine what it how small and cramped they are and how what a unbelievably cruel invention that was and it's 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 a changer yeah. i think it, right. you know people see that and they just can't believe it yeah. so it's just marching on with education yeah, in every in any possible way, way. Can. yeah it's interesting canada there was just some uh news out that uh one of the agricultural associations is going to permit the continuation of the use of farrowing crates to 2029 it uh, was back in 2014, the use of farrowing crates was supposed to be eliminated, I believe, by 2022, if not sooner. And wow. now they've been able to pressure, pol offer pro uh, political pressure, and they push that back further again. Yeah. Because they know it's just the same thing as a Canadian transport laws for animals, that they right. know that should those changes come into effect, it's going to be harder for them to do business. In fact, it might even be impossible for them to do business. So yeah. we have to we have to look at it all from from our, our ministries of health as to the benefits of the money could be saved as to the environmental impact if we adopt a plant based agricultural system which will reinvigorate the agricultural system and um, you know just for the health of our communities in general and the animals eliminating this suffering to billions of animals mm -hmm. yeah yeah totally so well on a, a positive note uh, do you guys have any exciting future plans and uh, where can our listeners find you if they want to know more about your story so our, our, our platforms uh, are mainly um, Indian Rock Vegans on Facebook group is a closed group that we invite everybody uh, that's where you will see the um, the, the health aspects, health uh, component of this lifestyle. And then, of course, our open uh, Facebook page, Dan Sean Moskluck, uh has the, uh, the animal rights and everything in between, uh, health and everything. And then on Instagram uh, and Twitter, Indian Rock Vegans. 
Uh, we have dabbled in YouTube. I guess when you look at as Indian rock vegans, that's probably one of the things that we would like to see. Uh, cre we've created a lot of content for we we were uh, we are brand ambassadors for Orange Fitness here, and we've done a lot of cooking content for them. So we'd like to increase that. But yeah, mm -hmm. Instagram uh, and Facebook, Indian Rock Vegans, or, or Dan and Sean Moskaluk, and we're contributors it, for Jane Unchained. Yes, that's the other thing oh, too. Great. We didn't get. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah we had her on our yeah, show not did, too long yeah. ago. Yes, 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 we've been. Uh, we're one of two Canadian contributors, so we're the West Coast contributors for Jane Unchained. So we do wow. travel quite a bit. We were just out in Kelowna yesterday at one of the shops. So that's one of the things we. You can see us there at Jane Unchained uh, uh, News Live. Um, and then exciting news. Well, we want to carry on COVID, but, uh, you know. We <laughs> are uh, planning on, um, we've always wanted to open a bed and breakfast. And oh, we awesome. decided that we would like to do a whole food plant-based vegan bed and breakfast. Oh, we're there. Um, we will be we're there. there. Your first Great. customers are here. Yeah, we'll, we'll be the guinea okay. pigs. So yeah, we love to come it. to the Okanagan it's, and stuff. Well, it's here. a little nerve-wracking because it's a, you know, at this point smaller. in time, it's a smaller um, clientele that right. you're appealing to because there's no way I'm, you know, there's no way anybody's going to be having bacon and eggs for breakfast. <laughs> so, um, so we'll see how that goes, but we've always wanted to do a bed and breakfast and so we, it's that has evolved over the years and so we're we're hoping Hope, to well, uh, hopeful so the format would be you know come it's just the room rental with the meals or different packages or even with sean's she's the subject matter expert and i've always said it that it's because of her beautiful intelligence <laughs> that i'm still alive today so oh, have wow. lecture series uh, bring people in as well and have immersion retreat style things stays that are a bit longer uh she'll drag them up the hill uh, we'll throw, throw you in the, the lake. lake. We'll, do, you know. we'll take your car keys away. And, uh, okay. Nobody delivers pizza out here. So, so yeah, <laughs> that and it too is a, as a safe haven for for burnt out activists too. Because yeah. we we you know even right as it is night too we, we you know we get a lot of often of our friends will come out and kind of decompress here at Indian Rock. It's just it's such a beautiful area for that. So. I think that's the, the, the yeah. what we really want to do. Yeah, so that's that's, awesome. that's mm -hmm. kind of the plan. And then uh, hopefully when COVID is uh, concluded, whenever that might be, get <laughs> back to more activism. Yeah, right. And, um, yeah. yeah, so online yeah. activism, online advocacy through the, the cooking uh, content and anything we can and, and that and, and support our fellow activists as well with their efforts and stay connected with our, our beautiful, wonderful community, which... Again, today was was such a, uh, a great opportunity to meet you two and, and yeah. work with you. And Likewise, thank yeah. you. Yeah, Thanks for yeah. Such a taking good time. the time to tell your emotional story. I know it's hard to say sometimes, <laughs> but it really, you know, right at the heart. Right, and it's so inspiring, right? Like mm -hmm. other people can do it too. You guys are such a living proof. You know that being plant based works, and it's really also about your attitude. You know how you handle stressful situations as well, and then the support you have yes. around you, right? You guys mm -hmm. have yes. such a great family that you guys support each other and make it through. You know, no matter what. Yeah, exactly. And you don't even think yeah. of, yeah. oh, what if I don't make it through? No, I will make it through somehow. You'll get it. Like we yeah. can believe in miracles. You know, you know, Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, hope without hope we have nothing. So you always have to hope, and and uh, you know it's uh, it's certainly you want to stack those odds in your favor as best as possible to have the healthiest life. You want to live, 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 and then drop. You don't want to live and then have that steady decline for your last fifteen years of misery and illness and you know uh, immobile immobility um, and adopting a plant based lifestyle. That's definitely the way to do it. Exactly. That's the hope. That's wow. the hope. <laughs> totally. And I'm sure you guys inspire more people. You know, it's just through the internet. Thanks, thank God we're going to just like spread it all over the world. And mm -hmm. that's yeah. right. They can do it too. And you really give the yeah. people the feeling, you know, what? You ignite the really that they can do it too. You know, it's mm -hmm. really like you guys well, have we, we such really a great so. story and it's well, just thanks. like so inspiring. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thanks uh, for allowing us to, to share this time with you. Yeah. Oh, thank Our you pleasure. guys. Yeah, well, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, yeah, well, maybe we'll have to have you guys come back on. I know you could probably still talk more. We didn't even get to ask any questions we really <laughs> wanted to, but it's all right. The yeah, story, exactly. I think, is the most important. <laughs> and we hope to see you in Vancouver again, you know? Let us yes. know. And let yes. us know. We have a lot yeah. of new plant-based restaurants open up, oh, even during COVID. Like, yeah. just went to one last Saturday, and 
Yeah. So amazing, right? And you gotta try it's Mila. Amazing. Mila's it's amazing. just a so many yeah. shout outs, so many shout outs you could make <laughs> oh. to all these fabulous oh. places. Totally. Vancouver yeah. is just crazy and oil free awesome. interestingly enough oil free is starting wow. to become a known term so, so there you, go. you yeah. know plant-based oil free not just vegan yeah, yeah that's great so, yeah exactly <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> great well we talk soon and we can't wait to hear more stories on your social media we yeah. always like to go there and see what you guys are up to yeah Excellent. indian rock vegans we're always here sounds <laughs> great. great all right guys take, take care. care bye bye all right thank you so much yeah our pleasure. bye now bye, bye. Okay.